All right. The meeting will come to order. Uh, we are all here tonight. Unfortunately, uh, Philip had a problem with email. So uh, that's why he missed the last meeting. <laughs> but we're so glad to have you back. Um, public comments on non-agenda items? Nancy, mm -hmm. uh, may I make an announcement at this point in time in the agenda, if, if it will? Yes. Sir. I just want to let everyone know in the audience um, and anyone listening that the city did receive a letter from the State Department of Housing and Community Development this afternoon indicating that our draft, well, actually our adopted housing element with some revisions that staff worked on with HCD staff is going to be deemed uh, substantially compliant with state law. Very good. So it's a massive milestone here, a <laughs> two-year effort to get to this point. Um, and so we will be bringing the housing element to the city council on September 13th for its adoption. And with that, we, should, we will be concluding the housing element adoption uh, phase. And then we're going to be pivoting to the land use element implementation. And we'll talk about that tonight, yeah. obviously. Okay. But I just want to make that announcement for Very everyone. Very good. The, the letter from HCD will be posted to the city's website tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. A few hours went into that. Uh, all right. Any other comments on non-agenda items? Uh, Chair Gardner and members of the committee, my name is Jim Mosier. Uh, first, I wanted to thank the staff for moving you to this new uh, venue, which I think the sound and the recording will work a lot better than it did at the other location. And in the unlikely event that you fill the room here, I th it can be expanded, you know, with the doors in the back. And the other comment I wanted to make, I may be the only one brave enough to make this. I, I, f I find this committee extremely small, and it's very unusual talking to such a small committee, and I think the general plan is a very important thing. And as someone who believes in government being done by collective decision-making. It's a very small body to be doing that, especially when one is absent. So uh, I, I appreciate the city council set it up this way, but I think they made a mistake in doing that. Thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure how to take that. But <laughs> uh, all right, any other comments? All right, can I have a motion, Kimberly, to approve the minutes? I motion to approve the minutes. And I'll second it. Because you uh, right second? Here. No, you, have, you can't because oh, you weren't okay. here. Oh. You have to abstain. Okay. So. Chair Gardner, does yes. that include the edits suggested by um, a member of the public? Yes. I assume. Thank you. All right. So yes. I vote aye. Aye. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, formation of the General Plan Advisory Committee. So I think what, what we'll do here is, first of all, the committee, small as we are, We'll discuss it, bring up any questions that we have, uh, and to address staff, and then the public can make comments and suggestions as how, and then we will finalize it. Um, I find the language a little bit confusing. I, th I think I know what you mean. But when you say not more than one member from the sample, for a maximum of six members, in other words, we would only have one arts commissioner but um, the sample is maybe just uh, not more than one member from any group or something like that, or any commission or committee. Or? Yeah, Chair Gardner, we, we noticed that as well today as we were looking at it again. I think there's a missing word in there or a phrase, but the intent is really just one from each group. So right. one arts commissioner, one uh, library board, one harbor commissioner, um, but for a total of six out of those groups. <clears throat> Right, and, and that one is very is pretty specific. Those are all city boards, commissions, or committees. So we, we know that one. Now the next one, again, the same issue with language, but um, the non-city boards. Would you like us tonight, with the help of the public, to provide in these other areas lists, additional names? You've given a sample to say this is what they're like. But would you like specific names and that sort of thing? I think either I think it can be done that way. I mean, we we just noted these just because they obviously they're known to us, but there are other groups out there. Um, and the the ETC means that you know the committee would also examine a group other groups, other representation from other groups that aren't listed. Because we don't want to limit the list to that list to that group. Um, 
but if there are other groups, that, but you can expand it if you like. Kimberly? Just for my clarification, can you outline what the process looks like? So once we establish these, these groups, what happens and how do we actually select the individuals that are going to be on the, on the committee representing each one of these groups? Uh, sure. You know, I think Mr. Zadiba is prepared to kind of, you know, present the recommendation. Again, what, what you see here is a reflection at least of what we heard at the last meeting. Um, and there is a, we have a slide on the selection process and we'd actually be turning that over to you folks to do as opposed to having the city council uh, do it. And then yeah. you would make we a recommendation. We will hold, hold that very tightly. Um, <laughs> but as far as identifying the people who are they, going they, into uh, the Applications, that there will be uh, notices sent, sent out. Got it. And okay. applications will come in and we'll review the, the applications. We'll talk about that also. But I, I want to make clear, my understanding of this is that uh, for example, you might have the, the Chamber of Commerce might submit and say, this is, this is our official candidate for a position on GPAC. And we say, oh, yeah, okay, we think that's a good person, so we have a, a Chamber of Commerce member. That, in my mind, though, does not eliminate someone else who might be a member of the Chamber uh, who ticks other boxes that we want to have. Um, because someone like the Chamber, they have hundreds of members. And to exclude all of them for one, they would say, you may be a member of the chamber, but you're representing yourself. That's the way I'm reading it. Is that the way you think of it also? Yeah, I think so. That, that is indeed how we in, intended okay. it as well. You might have a major you know, uh, employer in town who is a stakeholder and might fit into another category, or even a resident who owns a business in town who might be uh, a, a perfect uh, person here. But then, you know, you know, Chamber of Commerce, you know, maybe that's Steve Rosansky or his delegate who, who really represents the organization. Right. They, and that, that would be like, like the, the Arch Commission, assuming there's a, that's the official position of the commission when their member speaks, whereas someone who else might represent art in some way, but that's not the official Exactly. There may be someone who may be a business owner or, or a resident who may, you know, uh, f find uh, support the arts and, and may you know, be aligned in those respects, but maybe not representing the commission itself. Yeah. I would think the, the commission representa representation would be selected by those commissions. So the, the Harbor Commission yes. would identify that person, Planning Commission would identify yes. that person. And that, the first one's very easy, but the others, we could have, you know, there's six, there are four members, but we could have 12 applications because of the various groups. And that's where the, the, the selection process would come in. I they hope was, so. Yeah. They, well, it'd be nice if we did, yes. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with the various divisions. I don't know how the rest of you feel. So any thoughts on that? Philip? Yeah, I guess the only thing I would say is... It, with what you're saying, would you not see additional members that may be part of those groups as being a part of just the public comment period versus the committee? How do you limit? Well, uh, no, obviously, people could comment. But my concern is that, as I say, we see one candidate who's just applied for the, uh, the at-large membership. Right. And we're going, oh, man, this, this person's great. Oh, but he's or she is you know, part of the chamber. That doesn't disqualify that person. That just person is not the official voice of, of the chamber that's representing something different. Is, are we on the same page there? Yes. Okay. But you're saying if they're nominated by another group? Yeah. Okay, that's what I was trying to clarify. Okay. okay. Um, so we can go through and obviously and add some, but I'd like to get the public's uh, reaction to this general breakdown and what, what, if there are any issues, problems, additions. No, <laughs> I thought he was getting up to say something. Chair Gardner, members, Chuck Fancher, Jasmine Creek. Uh, it would be helpful if that material that you're discussing were available to the people in attendance here to see either on screen or in paper. I, I don't have access to what you're describing. It's on the agenda, uh, yeah, which are out there. I see it. Very last page. Yeah, I see the formation of the committee, but I don't see any other discussion. It sounds like you're discussing a list of different uh, potential candidates and the like. Yeah, all, all, all we're I discussing. Have is the agenda. 
you, you don't have these. Uh, yeah, boxed area. Yeah, I do not attach, have that. You have attachment A in your. I, I do not. I printed the agenda because last meeting the agenda wasn't available, so I printed it, but nothing else. Okay. Um, do we have extra copies of, of about there? Here, Chuck. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not trying to dwell. I'm not trying to dwell on not having that. I just I'm like not, to make. No, no, no. I want to give it to you so that yeah. you have okay. it. It's always I'll much more helpful to be able to look at something when use you use the rest of my 60 seconds. <laughs> Our compliments. <laughs> Um, um, I, I would like to throw, ha, throw out some thoughts. Uh, you, you're discussing, you know, members of our community that are in established groups that are part of the decision making and, and community structure in our community, the Historical Society, Arts Committee, as two examples. Uh, I would hope that this discussion also gets into actors who will be involved in the in the real time uh, delivery of goals and objectives that the general plan speaks to. For example, including multifamily development developers, affordable housing people, the regional transportation people. It would be great to have Lyft and Uber to sit and be a voice in this deliberation, difficult to do, but if that's a voice that is going to be part of our circulation future. And I wonder if we can make, sh if we are thinking about how to bring the enablers and the actors that bring our general plan goals to fruition involved in addition to the members of our community that sit here every day. Um, Only thought. Are you suggesting non-residents? case of the regional transportation if a if that agency doesn't have a member of Newport Beach uh, uh, who could be who could serve that function yes All right. their, we, their voice is needed we decided last time that we would uh, keep it to res, uh, Newport residents but staff is always very good about with the relevant uh, elements bringing in speakers to the committee to educate them and, and broaden perspectives and everything. So there will be that kind of input. It may, they just may not be voting members. Then, then I would hope there would be a, a priority put on that input. You know, we members need those external persons who know the businesses they're in to help us. I, a staff doesn't usually overestimate our knowledge. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> In, in preparing things. <laughs> yes. Nice. Yes. Uh -huh. To your comment, I, I think that really is an important point. I'm usually sitting on the other side after a city's made a decision in a vacuum and living with those decisions. And I think, I think it's a great point. Whether it's staff doing workshops with various groups, as you're saying, I think it's, I think it's a great idea. And, and as I say, I'm assuming that we're going to be following a lot of the patterns of the last time. And we had a lot of that. We were, you know, we got, when it came to the circulation, we had some experts come in. When it came to even looking at housing, we had different types of housing people come and talk to us about various things. So uh, a real effort to, to both educate those of us who were not knowledgeable in a particular area uh, and, and also just to bring new ideas and, and new perspectives. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh-huh, Jim. Uh, thank you again, uh, Chair Gardner. I have about four comments on this. I submitted some in writing this afternoon, but they may have been too late for you to have a chance to look at. In those, I observed that this table that you have and it's on the screen up here is basically copied from the one that was used in 2001 for forming the slightly larger GPAC, and it was recommended by a 10-member steering committee. And one thing I thought was better about the previous way the table was laid out, the last two categories that you have up there, geographic areas and diversity of interests. In the previous resolution, those two were combined together. So it just said diverse, at-large membership with emphasis on geographic diversity. And I think that is a better way. In that case, they were picking 21. Here you would be picking 14 members who have some combination of interest and geographic diversity together. Uh, the way it's set up here seems like it's 
kind of set up to fail because you have at least eight different and there's probably more geographic areas you aren't represented and you're only telling yourself to pick, I guess, six out of that so you cannot represent all the areas. Uh, if you do it the other way, as was done before, lumping the two together and just picking the people with geographic and interest diversity in mind, then you can kind of mix and match the things. It's more fluid and you can achieve what you're trying to achieve there, I think, in both categories. And then another thing I noticed that was missing from this resolution, not the table, but the resolution, is how the committee is going to organize itself. The previous one designated that the city's mayor would pick the chair of the committee, which I don't think is a particularly great idea. Uh, but this is silent on how, and it's the only committee in the city that I'm aware of that the enabling resolution doesn't say how it will be structured in terms of its internal management. So I think this needs to address whether it will have chair and a vice chair and how they will be chosen, whether they will rotate, how that's going to work. And then the final comment, you mentioned that you, the committee here, would be looking at the applications. And as I'm sure all of you remember, because in getting on this committee, you submitted a standard city board commission and committee application. And I would suggest to you that the application form you want for this probably should be a little different than the standard city application form. And you should perhaps discuss what you want to see. I don't know if you're planning to call the people in individually, but the standard form is probably not going to give you all the information you need to evaluate how good a fit those people would be for the GPAC. So you probably want some specific questions to ask of them and see answers. It might be a multi-page application form. I don't know. That's something for you to discuss and determine. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dave Tanner, Newport Beach resident. Uh, I commented on this at your last meeting uh, when you determined that uh, uh, you did not want to have uh, outside experts as uh, members of the, uh, of the committee. Um, I think as far as members of the committee go, I think this time, because of the, the focused nature of what you're going to be looking at, the general plan and the update, and housing, which is the incentive for the general plan update. Uh, I think you need to look at a person based on their qualifications, their understanding of the topic. Uh, and I think that if they represented the same agency as somebody else, let them be transparent about that. And if you feel that they are the best qualified, select them anyway, but transparency is the key. I think that's very important. And I think it's also very important uh, for this committee to hold public workshops in the future uh, and to have the committee invite outside expertise, like you talked about, uh, and allow the public to ask questions of these outside expertise, not our staff and our staff's consultants who already have a fixed opinion, but we would like to get an independent opinion and independent answers to our questions. That, to me, is critical. Uh, for example, the Southern California Association of Governments. They're controlling everything within Southern California in terms of housing elements. It sure would be nice to have a representative from them here talking about it and cumulative growth and how that's going to affect us. And it would be nice to know uh, if people on this new committee are going to understand what cumulative growth is or if they're just going to be on it for arts and other things. So I think qualifications is key because of the focused nature that most people, unless you're in the industry, aren't really going to fully comprehend. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Hi, I'm Joy Brenner, and I'm on the council, just in case I need to add that. Um, I just had a thought as I was looking at this about geographic area. Is there a reason that we wouldn't use council districts as our geographic areas? 
Well, there's no reason why we couldn't do that. So, you know, the, the thoughts about combining those two categories um, or council districts, I mean, any of these ideas are, are yeah. valuable. I just thought since we yeah. work so hard to get these districts and redistrict and everything, that maybe it would be a good idea to go by council districts for that. So just an idea. Well, obviously, we would have to have district representation. But I think the other point of it is there are particular areas that, really do are so unique that they would probably benefit by some kind of representation. And I say Santa Ana Heights with all of its horses and that sort of thing is very different and its needs. So um, other comments before we get, get start to discuss what was brought forward? OK. Um, to go back to uh, Mr. Mosier's, what do you think about combining the two last areas? You do just have 14. Uh, members of uh, geographical and diversity of representation. I mean, I, I don't have a real strong feeling one way or the other myself. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a really strong feeling about it. I think it gives us a little more flexibility. But I, I, I don't feel strongly either way. Um... As far as, oh, God, I can't read my handwriting. <laughs> Jim, come back up here a minute. <laughs> you had four. Give me a real quick cue so I can look at my notes again. Oh, that's right. Okay, that's what, oh, that's what that word is, chair. Okay. <laughs> Got the chair and the application and combining categories. What else am I missing? I think there was a statement about the um, um, the application process and whether we would use the city's application okay, right, with maybe okay. a, a supplemental questionnaire yeah. and and I like that suggestion actually that would help the committee in my opinion you yeah. know use the standard form but have a supplemental questionnaire that is geared toward the issues the general plan and maybe these target areas and and, and their qualifications and, and I think it's very important in the application to say that um, this committee will probably be meeting for two years at least. Uh, at least once a month, perhaps more, because we may need occasionally to double up or something. So let them know the workload, because uh, it's considerable. And uh, people have all sorts of good intentions, and they go, well, I can't, I can't come tonight. It's just interfering with my life. Um, so that, and I had s assumed that as the committee picks, the, this committee picks the big committee, that we would also recommend a chair. But that was... Um, what is your thinking about that? I, I agree. So that would be okay. So that's and and of course this will all be presented to the council and they can throw the whole thing out if they don't like uh, the process. So uh, we will create a new application. Um, we will combine uh, the last two to give us ourselves greater flexibility. Um, in looking at at these. Uh, the non-city boards, you have OASIS, the school district, historical societies. Can anybody think of some other groups that we would want to include that? Because we've got four, four potential members. Because if not, we might not need that, not need four. So, uh, yes. Chuck Fancher again. I'm, I'm looking, Nancy, at your chart on the board uh -huh. and the top of it, your your board commissions and the like. One of the uh, under the heading of there are the members of the community that will be that will live under the general plan for the next 20 years, and then the actors in the committee that will affect our the plan over the next 20 years and make it happen in real time. One of them would be the water utilities d district. Is that getting too far into the weeds? But they are a major player in our environmental future. The utilities, the, the utilities commission. Again, where, where do you draw the line? I understand, and I, but I think again um, that may be something where we would have someone. Uh, of course, we do our own water here, so we have a lot of expertise. But if we wanted something from like the OCWD to talk about re replenishment and what the plans are for the future, that would be certainly something we could bring in for that expertise.
<laughs> all here. My view of our world uh, in the environmental side of Newport Beach's present and future is that and no reflection on the Harbor Commission or the Parks, Beaches, and Recreation Commission whatsoever in terms of their vitality. But the, the provision of water to our city over the next 20 years forward is critical, an issue. It's not going to be business like it was done yesterday. And that needs to be reflected. That importance needs to be reflected. And I would think that Mark Volkovic should be part of our examination of our future and the creation of a general plan because it's a vital topic. All right. Well, he's, he will not have a vote for sure. <laughs> um, and we have we'll, one of the categories is from the Water Quality Committee, which has done uh, a lot of times done things on water supply and water replenishment and that sort of thing following up. That is the one committee in, in the city that tends to really focus on that sort of thing. Um, Chair Gardner, yes. If, if I might just add, um, you know, along the line, and, and maybe in response to Chuck's comments here, when, when we speak about staff and doing a general plan update, staff is the entire staff of the city: public works, finance, police, fire, utilities. Um, every department will play a role in what we're doing going forward. Uh, the Recreation and Senior, uh, Services Department will be playing a significant role in, in creating and drafting and editing that element with the community's help. And so those needs are well known and, and clearly water is important. I ask that question all the time. Where's the water coming from? And, 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 and we have three water agencies in this community, not just one. And, um, um, you know, Mark is, is well aware of, of the water uh, demand requirements. And I know we can fold that into the committee for the expertise provided by staff, but you know, we will provide that information as we go forward. Right. And I think, again, that is one of the roles of this particular committee, is to make sure that there are voices besides staff voices. I mean, staff doesn't know everything. We, we all understand that. And to bring in, make sure, oh, you know, we, we see the little, we need some outside voices here. We could use some expertise and new perspectives and that sort of thing. So the steering committee, that is certainly, I think, one of our responsibilities to make sure as we follow along that the general plan advisory committee uh, is getting what we feel is a sufficient background and, and perspective. I mean, I was just talking, you know, we were at the uh, Butt Gully thing this afternoon and I was saying, you know, our current general plan is a 20th century plan. And this is going to be very much a 21st century plan. And it's almost, it'd be almost fun to have a futurist or something at some point <laughs> to say, whoa, that's really nice. You know, just to spur, spark uh, all sorts of creative ideas. Because we are going to be living in a, mm -hmm. particularly our, our children, well, not my children, your children, <laughs> my grandchildren, living in such a different world. Uh, Jim, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, current topic you're asking question about, asking us to think of more non-city boards, commission, and committees. I noticed the next category under that, environmental interest groups, is mostly could be described as non-city committees of various kinds. So an obvious solution might be to move the number, reduce the number in the non-city boards, make that a smaller number to pick, and you seem to have an abundance of environmental groups, so perhaps pick more from that category. That's an interesting thought. What do you think? Make, move the non-city boards to three and, and increase the environmental impact in, invoice or another add it to another area, not necessarily. In, I don't betray my prejudice. Of course, we should need, always need more environmental representatives. But, uh. I, I, I mean, in my opinion, I think that a lot of the, I mean, there's the environmental groups are great. I think that a lot of them are going to have a very similar perspective, whereas some of the non-city boards and commissions are going to very much vary, like the historical society is going to have a completely different uh, perspective than, you know, the school district. But can we think of more than three? That, that was, I think that was what sort of prompted the, the, the question. Uh, Dennis, did you have a comment? Yeah, um, just that under the groups that are listed there, you omitted the uh, Newport Bay Conservancy, which obviously is... Very important. Okay, we're not. We're not. We're going to be listing. Go, I want to go through all these. Just okay. To get, that's. Get, I didn't know where yeah, where you were because yeah. I just came in. Sorry. Yeah, we're just on the non-city boards and commissions like Friends of Oasis, the school district. Yeah. Um, Jim had just mentioned the environmental yeah, groups. That's why. Right. I thought of that. that well, that was. Me. Yes. 
Hi, my name is Amber Snyder and I work with uh, Kevin Bass and we have just formed the Newport uh, Beach Fire Safe Council. So that would be something we would like to also be considered. The Newport Beach Fire Safe Council. What is it? Fire. Fire. Fire safe. safe council. I thought you said faith, and I was fire and faith. And no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. And that also brings up perhaps, I don't know, should we have a faith? Oh. Um, and I don't know, would you send it out to all the churches or something? And We have under... At large members. Oh, okay. That's we where it's covered. Based. Okay. All right. Um, also, the Balboa people. Peninsula has formed a new chamber of commerce, the Balboa Chamber of Commerce. Well, that they have be, about 300 that in, in the business. members. But I, I would just think that it's really important that you not be too rigid about this so that you allow yourselves as much flexibility as possible. Because what if you don't get you know, enough people to come up with six in one category and you've got some, I mean, just so that you guys have as much flexibility as you need in order to. Yeah, and I, I, my concern is I would like to be sure that we send notices to as many groups and as possible. And so if we're missing something very obvious here, that's right. So, okay, well, we've covered that. So we turn the page and the environmental groups, uh, Newport, Bay Conservancy. Um, I think that's that. And then the business interest groups, you said the Balboa Peninsula or just Balboa Chamber of Commerce, Joy? Okay, the Balboa Chamber, Conamar Chamber, Visit Newport Beach, the BIA. Uh, anything else? Any other obvious choices? Because this will be spread as well. I mean, the others will come in anyway. They'll say, oh, we, we saw the, the, the notice. Um, and so we're going to combine the geographic areas with the diversity. And so we want, do we want to be sure that we have uh, a representative from each of the council districts? I think so. All right. So that's, that's something that we will have. So would, would, would you think that would be a resident of each district that would just apply at large and then, or are you thinking of something that the council would appoint? No, no, curious. I think this is just something that we need to be, as we go through, okay. we will be sure that each council has a representative, just as we'll look like, and it may be, I mean, you could see, oh, this person has this particular talent and okay, lives in, right. which makes it yeah. so easy for us. Okay, so um, then, you're going to post a notice and send these various things, the city will, and they will, with their new application, and they will go to... They will actually come to the committee, and that's, um, I believe that's in the resolution on, just below the table, if you've got the, uh, the resolution itself, and actually it's up on the screen now here. The thought that we had was, is that you would review the applications right. and then make a recommendation to the city council and, 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 and back to the table, you know, I, you know, we weren't looking to exclude anyone. We're looking to include, and so obviously anybody that we've overlooked, like the Planning Commission, we can include that. Um, but the, the point is, is that I'm also thinking that it might be good to have guide, make, look at them as guidelines. I think the overall goal was to have a very diverse group of people that represent a whole different swath of issues. Right. And I think that it would be up to the committee then to, to find those people and, and do their best to fit them in the categories, but you know, as Joy indicated, having a little flexibility there, if you still get a good result, but not exactly precise those numbers, I, I would think that the committee would have the, the latitude to make that recommendation to council and then uh, see where it goes, so. All right, thoughts. so what is our timing here in terms of what the deadline will be for the applications to be returned? Um, typically that happens about two weeks process uh, that the city clerk do, does the notification um, and uses the, the standard city application. What I would want to do is augment that 
you know, with some several questions, just a few, just to, so that we can understand people's, you know, where they live, how long they've lived in the community, um, you know, what their interests are. Do they represent a, a group? Um, are, you know, are they interested in issues about Corona Del Mar? You know, we want questions that kind of solicit information that would be helpful for you to make selections. And also plain, so, so as we do with the regular application, that they can type in and just write a novel if they want to about why they're qualified. Certainly, they could put whatever they want in that application, I would think, and then um, you, would, you would get a copy of all of those, and then you would have a selection process, and then... All right, so um, that comes to something that's a little delicate. We are a Brown Act. Are we going to do this process of selection here in front of all these people? That's <laughs> so we say, oh my God, who, why would anybody... <laughs> <laughs> That, 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 that does pose a delicate question here. I, I would like to think that there could be, you know, less than a quorum of the group that might be, well, that's only one person, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, it does present some challenges. At the end of the day, the recommendation needs to be done at a, at a notice public meeting, and we need to make sure that's so everyone understands what the recommendation is, and then we'll take it to the city council. How, how to deal with the Brown Act is, is, is challenging, but... Um, whether there's interviews and one-on-one -on -one interviews with one of you, and then... I'm, I'm quite honest, I'm not sure how to do that, because obviously with two people to get together, it's a meeting. Yes. So that's going to be, that's going to be interesting. Maybe we can do rankings. We can create some sort of sheet. I think that's possible. If, if you individually go through the materials and then rank them and then review them at a public meeting and then make a recommendation from that, that would be, that oh, would great. be workable. Oh, great. Okay. And in fact, that's something as a committee that we could, we could work on and present at our next meeting uh, and co coalesce that as far as all of our input. That's a great idea, I think. That, that makes it less personal. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, I like that idea. Thank you. I think that that's, saves us a lot of angst. Okay. I think we're pretty well started. No? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh-huh. On, on that process, um, at the application, you mentioned the application process. So would an organization make a recommendation? And I'm going to use Spawn as an example. So Spawn would come up as an organization and say, this is who we would want to represent. Because what if people, when you apply, as an at-large person, you right. could also have a foot in many of these organizations. Right. And I think just before you got here, yeah. we talked about that. Okay, so, and And... Um, and it's important to me, and I think that one of the things we we should explain in the um, as we send out this this notice uh, yeah, is that particularly the groups should really look at their canvas because just because it's it's a spawn doesn't mean it's I mean there's only a certain number from those groups that we're going to pick doesn't mean automatically they will get picked so the groups will want to say not only does this person represent Spawn, but here are all the other qualifications. I think that's really important because you go, oh, wow. I mean, when you compare these two and you put our scores down, that could really make a big difference in terms of, of the choice and who makes the final cut. So I, I think that will be something to, to, to explain to particularly the groups that don't just put there from Spawn, really give us the the biography and, and that sort of thing. And perhaps encourage more than one application. So yeah. if they've got somebody maybe that we wouldn't have selected otherwise, but is in a district that we need. Uh, yeah. Yeah, with, with regard to the Brown Act and interviewing applicants, I just, for the committee's information, this may seem strange to people in Newport Beach, but our two neighboring cities, Costa Mesa, and Laguna Beach, when the council wants to make appointments to a committee, they actually do the interviewing in public. The entire council calls in their candidates, and the entire council can ask questions of them in public. And I think that's actually probably a better system than we have now. You would not necessarily have to interview all of the candidates, but if you get a huge number of applications, the top number that you're thinking between, you could then all, the three of you ask questions to the people here in person. I mean, if they're going to be on a committee, they have to be able to answer questions in public. So <laughs> yeah. I, I don't see that there's yeah. anything wrong with that. No, I don't either. And in fact, that's the only way we're, we're going to be able to do it since there are only three of us. And, 
Good afternoon, Nancy Scarborough. Thank you. Um, a couple things. A, a practical matter, you're going to have 30 candidates. You might have 90 people applying. To interview 90 people in public is going to be very difficult. I don't uh, know how. Right there, I, I think we agree, but not necessarily everybody gets interviewed. Okay. So there we go. Uh, and the second thing um, I'm thinking is for the boards who are recommending a member or as their representative, um, would those people also fill out an application? Because I think that information could be beneficial in making those decisions. They might not just be a spawn board member. They might have a variety of talents and interests. Yes, so, yes, okay. that, absolutely. So they would fill out the same application even though they're being recommended by that organization. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? All right, we're on our way. You know, we're inventing things as we go along. <laughs> but I think the, the, the process um, is good. I think we've got a pretty good group. We can be a little bit flexible. And I, I'm really, I know we'll get some just terrific applications. I'm looking forward to, to reviewing those. Yeah. All right, uh, let's see. The next thing is oh, update Karen, on the housing. Yes. Before we move on to the uh, next agenda item, you know, one of the things we'd like to do is to move fairly rapidly. We had anticipated maybe getting through this this evening, and then we mm -hmm. would go to the city council at the next meeting on September 13th. Um, I think given all the feedback that we're getting here, I'm, I, I want to make sure. I, I don't want to just put something forward to the city council without you seeing it, um, especially given the, the amount of changes here. And the, and the, you know, would you like us to meet briefly to review what you have? I think that would be good. Okay. You know, maybe we can do that. Um, I don't think we're going to have the questionnaire ready to go before we go to the city council, but I think we'll have that before we push it out the door. Um, once the city council uh, has an opportunity to obviously receive the recommendation from the group, I'd like to try to meet that schedule if we can. Um, okay. But um, you know. So what? What are some dates? Yeah, are we going to have time? No, because the resolution is due. <laughs> we might need to push this back to the next meeting in, in September because the resolution for. Uh, doing this is actually already at the city attorney's office for review and so we would have to put all these parameters in there now all the all the different names um you know is that something that we could edit and then i can send you nancy to see if it comports with what you believe the committee has done and then you can give us direction and allow us to, to submit it to council is that all right I'm fine with that. Yeah. Okay. that seem reasonable all right yeah. okay <clears throat> okay we'll do that oh and also um vacations are you guys taking off in the next month or so Days that we want to be careful of? I am, but I'm not certain when. Okay, all right. I'll work around it, though. Okay. Kimberly? Yeah, I'll work around it. All right, all right. And then may I ask, who's drafting the questionnaire? Who's who's tasked with this? Well, Ben and I will be the first to, to take a, okay. a, a crack at what the questionnaire will be. I, is, is that something that, that the committee wants to see before it's attached to the application? We can have another meeting, maybe say... Um, in late September, um, once the council has endorsed the process and the formation of the committee, I think the questionnaire is something that we can share with you, and, and you can evaluate that, and we can we can push it out the door, you know, the week after, let's say. Can we? Can you send it to the to us, and then if any of us has a, a, a problem with it, then we have a meeting. But if we don't have a problem, or is that still a violation? I have to be careful about sending a, a document to three of the committee members. Um, you know, I need to, we need to do this public in a public process. Okay. And so, even you know, if I'm soliciting feedback from, you know, you're having a well, I'm saying a if, if, at that if there was no, well, I guess even no feedback is feedback in a sense. We're saying we approve it. Yeah. I, I think what we'd want to do is schedule a meeting in September, right. um, say after the 13th, and we can share with you a draft, and then we could massage that, and then attach it to the application before the clerk sends it out. Okay, that, and that's good, and that, that also gives us time. I, I like the idea of a, another meeting just because we have one more look at this in case as, you know, during the next week or two, so, oh, you should have done this, or somebody else comes up to us and says, did you think about that? And we, had, we could look at that. So uh, if you'll send out some, some dates, I'm, I'm, I'm open, but uh, they how may have the, vacation how the 19, plans. How does the 19th work? Uh, September. September? Fine for me. We're checking to see if this room is open. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll, we'll send out some dates. Okay. And we'll schedule that. I, but I think that would be a fairly root, okay. fairly quick meeting. And, uh, you know, if there's any other agenda items that we might want to bring forward, we'll bring to you. Okay, good. All right. And then moving on now, land use element. Sure. So this item here, I think we have a brief presentation that I want to go over. 
So at the last meeting, and this, this is really stemming from the last meeting where we had a discussion about modifying the Kimley Horn contract to, to, to adjust the scope of work that they would be doing, the, the principal change um, was to add commercial development or at least to consider commercial development, you know, to do um, um, studies to see if, if indeed we need additional commercial development and, and what it would be and where. So, so that draft document, we, we did push, this up, push that out fairly rapidly, and unfortunately, due to some scheduling issues, I couldn't uh, coordinate with Kimley Horn before we did that. And so basically, this presentation, I want to explain to you that, that we need to unravel exactly what we were <laughs> suggesting we were going to do, and, 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 and the reason is really the schedule. Um, and so the, the housing element does necessitate that we go to a vote of the electorate in March of 2024. So when you start to draft that schedule, um, you know, we need to get to the city council before the end of the year in 2023. So if I'm going to do an EIR for that project, and we will, we're going to be doing traffic modeling and what have you, um, you know, we need to have what we call a stable project description. I need it almost <laughs> immediately, meaning we don't have time to start considering, you know, whether we should add additional commercial development. You know, you know, last week we did discuss, you know, we felt it was important to think about those issues going forward. Um, at, at, you know, given the, the, the state statute, which requires us to complete the housing element implementation, the rezones, if you will, uh, by, by uh, within a three-year time period and, and our commitment to do the vote in 2024, we really don't have the luxury of time to start thinking about whether we need additional commercial. Uh, you know, we will actually study that as part of the broader general plan update as we go forward with the committee and what have you. Because, you know, the housing's not going to all get built tomorrow um, and those needs aren't necessarily going to materialize tomorrow. So we will have the luxury of time to be able to actually thoughtfully think through, okay, do we have enough non-residential development in the right places to do the right things to serve a growing community? And, you know, we do want to thoughtfully go through that process. Um, and so what, what I'm really getting to is that we really need to focus in on just implementing the housing element right now. That part of the project description is perfectly stable. And that is those rezone policy actions, 1A through 1F, that are in the adopted six element. And that is where we're, you know, rezoning and creating overlay zones in our various focus areas to achieve the housing uh, element numbers um, that the state is requiring us to do. So we know where those sites are. We know what those densities are. We know where, where how many units it is. Uh, we can start the analysis now and complete and get and, and get this to the city council by the end of 2024. Uh, sorry, 2023, in order to make the the the, the ballot in March of 2020. And so, you know, it, it, we've got a project description, and we would look at that added commercial intensity as part of the comprehensive update. Now, one of the things we also wanted to to <clears throat> let the committee know about now that we're thinking is that you know. When we're looking at an overlay, we're going to be, we're, we're talking about adding an overlay to the airport area that just adds additional residential capacity. And that's what the housing element requires us to do at this point. Um, now, there's existing buildings there, you know, so we're going to be adding housing in the airport area. And this is just an example. It will happen in other sites in town, of course, but I'll use the airport area as an example because it's already starting to happen, starting to happen. In fact, it's already happened in Newport Center. If you, if you remember what was there before the Villas Fashion Island was there, there was the San Joaquin Hills uh, Plaza um, office area. And so we, we anticipate this to continue. You know, our housing element is built upon recycling, if you will, and replacing existing uses on the ground. So you've got an office building, um, and now it's turning into housing. And we've got examples of that in our community now. And as we go forward, the thought is, is that we would just overlay the area with this residential opportunity, but we would keep the underlying commercial intensity there. So what happens with that? Well, you know, it, it, it could turn into a mixed-use building where there is restaurants and retail and or offices inside the building that is now being built for housing. We can also consider uh, um, that unbuilt, you know, say you take down a, a, a perfectly good 60,000 square foot office building, and trust me, I'm getting developers asking me to do exactly that, and property owners are asking me to do that, that right now. Um, and they're going to build a, a, a residential um, project. Well, what are we going to do with that office building? Well, obviously, it'll be torn down, but, you know, could that be reused in, 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 a, in a way and recycled, if you will, 
you know, into the project site or possibly on a neighboring site nearby. It could turn into a restaurant. You know, and, and in essence, we would create a trip budget and that could be transferred to a property in the same statistical area, in the same neighborhood, if you will. So the thought is, is that while we do believe that additional commercial might be considerable, especially when we're taking down commercial office buildings and other uses for the housing, well, if we maintain that, in, that commercial intensity in the general plan, you know, we can repurpose that intensity to meet the commercial needs of the community going forward. And so you know, that may be a solution to where we might not need to add any more commercial in the, in the future if we have enough uh, that can be repurposed in the, in the way that I've described. And so we, we wanted to kind of just put that out to you as, as one of the thoughts that we're having um, as a way to kind of address the issue of, of losing all the commercial. Because you know, we're going to need some of that commercial to provide goods and services and places for people to work. And we're going to have a growing community. And we feel that that's important to think about. And so this is one of the, one of the, the factors that we're thinking it, that helps us, um, A, keep on, 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 on uh, schedule, if you will, to, to allow the housing as an overlay, but also to, to think about repurposing what's there and reusing it in, in ways that the community needs. So in, in, in essence, it allows us to continue forward today uh, without considering new commercial, but only just to consider you know, maintaining what's there. So uh, we, we wanted to just window this with you today and, and as one of the reasons why we feel we can kind of make this shift um, and just really focus in on, on implementing the housing element with the housing that's already been identified in the housing element. And then just maintaining the existing non-residential entitlement where it is, but maybe allowing some flexibility and reuse. So may, there you have okay. it. Yeah, may I ask a couple of questions with that? So when you say recycle, do you mean trips? density gla all of those things so yes okay uh, so if you're doing that are you then adding it in to the eir well because it, it's in the baseline of the eir right now if well you it think is about but it. if you're converting the zoning and now you're adding residential aren't you going to have to note that yes those, that additional amount so so the overlay process would be simply an additional opportunity for housing that's on the existing you know, fabric of the general plan. And so the existing uses are in the baseline uh, of the EIR, and then the added housing is what we're adding to the general plan. And the impacts of that would be known. So what- So what, you're not subtracting though. Exactly, okay. we're not subtracting the, okay. the non-residential intensity. And so um, the, 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 the number of units and the traffic trips, the AM and PM trips that would ultimately be in that charter section 423 vote Mm -hmm. are going to be substantial. Um, now, to the extent that we actually lose non-residential intensity and it's not actually rebuilt, then we will have a reduction, a net reduction in, 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 in trips. But that's post-EIR, correct? Correct. Yeah. And then the other thing you were talking about, the underlying zoning, the thing I like about what you just said is if you're converting it from office to residential, you're now creating a non-conforming use which creates, and I know you didn't say that, but if you were to do that, then you've got financing issues and all those things that go along with it. So you're able to keep both yes. zones? Yes, okay. that, that, that is the intent, is to basically keep, keep the underlying zoning. And so the existing development, you know, the property owner may decide, hey, you know, I like what I've got here and I don't plan to do anything. I'm yeah. not gonna take advantage of the housing. They're not non-conforming. They can continue as long as they like under the existing uh, um, zoning and general plan. Now with the new overlay, you know, if, if it makes sense to make the, the change in use, they can do so. But then the underlying development is still there and they could, they could choose to either you know, maintain some of it, if it fits, mm -hmm. if you will, physically fits, um, or you know, based on a, say a trip equivalency budget, a trip budget, they could convert the office building into a restaurant and then put it on the ground floor of the building and that would help service the needs of the community. And so that's just one example of how this might work. Uh, so it, 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 anyway, we wanted to window that with you today so that um, you know, at least that's, it, it's a simpler approach and it does meet the, 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 the goals of the community to maintain the existing underlying zoning and not make things non-conforming. Yeah. And again, just to overlay this residential um, um, opportunity. And then allow some flexibility 
on the reuse of what's there so that we can meet our commercial needs. And, and you know, the market will dictate a lot of that. Um, you know, when, at, as the housing gets built, you know, there will, there will be folks who want to take advantage. They'll see an, a market need for a restaurant or a small retail center or a small grocer. Uh, I don't see us putting in a brand new shopping center in the airport area. There's not enough density here. Uh, but, but ultimately, a small grocer or a, a small restaurant here or a small retail establishment with a dry cleaner, you know, the market will identify those needs over time and there'll, there'll be a mechanism um, in the, the overlay zoning that allows for that to occur without having a general plan amendment and without having a rezone either. And so we hope that that flexibility can be built into the plan. At least that's our, our, our goal at this point or our plan. And current zoning will allow that without having to amend the zoning code? Current zoning. Um, for well, dual uses, whether it's mixed use, office with residential and those things. In many respects, no, it doesn't. Um, in certain areas of town, we have mixed-use zonings, yes. Um, you know, we have mixed-use zonings with, with specific densities, and our housing element suggests more density. You know, I think in those particular zones, there might be a different formula for how the overlay would work. Um, you know, we might even be going to uh, a, a straight-up residential project with no uh, uh, commercial mm -hmm. on the ground floor. Um, in many respects, our, our, our mixed-use zones are not creating housing in the way that, that we might have anticipated in 2006 because of the commercial requirement and the parking that comes with it. When you put those two requirements on the ground floor, there's really no space to build the housing, and it, doesn't, it actually doesn't make financial sense to build the project. And so um, you know, part of the land use element update and the zoning overlays that come with it will be an examination of all of these issues with the all of the um, focus areas that you find in the housing element. And so there's gonna be different solutions for different focus areas. Um, but, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, it, it, when you look at, say, um, Newport Place planned community up in the airport area, there is a residential overlay in that planned community now. We're gonna be expanding upon that and modifying that, but it's gonna be a separate overlay and um, you know we do need to examine those existing policies and regulations to ensure there's no conflicts. And so it's going to get complicated because we have dozens and dozens of planned communities which are site-specific zoning, if you will, right? Neighborhood-specific zoning. Mm -hmm. And we have our zoning code. So we have a fairly complex zoning framework. You know, this overlay is going to just sit on top of all of that purposely to keep this as simple as possible so that it you know, when, when the package comes forward to the community and the package goes to the, obviously, the city council, um, you know, all of the rules are going to be right there in front of you and you're not going to have to go look at any, any other document, right? So we're going to definitely try to make it simple. Um, um, and, and it is consistent with the housing element in terms of what we've uh, indicated in policy to, to create an overlay so that the housing opportunity is created, but the existing non-residential opportunities where they exist are, are still there and we're not making things non-conforming. So it, 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 it's going to be a little bit of a complicated task to write these, these zones. Um, you know, one of the other promises we've made the community is that when we reach our housing goals, the housing, uh, you could build more housing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so the overlay uh, process citywide will allow us to do that. And so there's a, there's a lot of work ahead of us in this. But I wanted to kind of uh, showcase this today because it is different than what I told you at the last meeting we would do. And, and to address the issue of not looking at additional commercial, we feel that we can just retain what's there and repurpose it. So I think it accomplishes both goals, but we wanted to let you know what we're doing before we do it. <laughs> Even with the best laid plans, do you not see the EIR needing to be amended at some point anyway? An EIR will definitely have certain assumptions. It will lay out exactly where the housing is going to go and at what densities. That's already known to us. Um, but yes, there are assumptions there. Now, once the EIR is done and certified and the actions are taken and you know the dust settles, if you will, there's always going to be a, a, something that's different that will come right. down. And there are processes to you know, re-examine the issue, whether it's a supplemental EIR right. or an addendum to an, an existing EIR. Uh, those are for the projects that come forward that, that are slightly different than what we've planned for. There are processes for that, and, uh, and we, we would follow them, follow the law on that. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Kimberly? Okay. Um, public comment?
Uh, Chair Gardner, I, the theme I hear coming from the staff, which perhaps they didn't explicitly say, is that they're expecting a green light vote on the housing part of the general plan update, and they're hoping that they don't need a second green light vote on adding commercial property, which normally would trigger that. I understand that's their wish. I'm not sure it's realistic. If to add the 4,845 dwelling units, we actually have to add, say, 20,000, and there's two people in each of those dwelling units, that's adding 40,000 people to an 80,000 population that we have now. And I don't know that it's realistic to think you can add all of those people without adding new commercial opportunities unless there's a huge momentum towards online shopping and online working and all of that, perhaps. But I, I'm a little doubtful that's feasible. The item is perhaps a little different than I thought it was going to be. And the main comment I wanted to make, I tried to submit to you in writing, but through the mysteries of the internet, the email I sent this afternoon seems to be still ricocheting through cyberspace somewhere. And it only got to the uh, city staff here just a minute before the meeting started. At your last meeting, you recall, I pointed out that the Charter Section 423 green light at the end of it has a provision that says it actually does not apply if state law precludes a vote by the people on the particular general plan amendment that's before them. And we heard the staff is going to go ahead and have the vote. They are thinking the public is going to accept the plan. I am anticipating the public is likely to reject the plan. And I'm wondering if the staff has a really realistic idea of what the consequences would be of that rejection. It sounded like we'll figure it out after that happens. And I don't think that's a good plan at all. My concern is that if the people of Newport Beach reject the plan that you put forward, we're likely going to face litigation from the state. It may invalidate the vote that we take and have it be approved anyway by a court rather than by the people. But the thing I really fear is that the court might invalidate green light going forward in the future, not just this particular amendment, but they might declare that our entire green light provision in our charter, which I think is very important, might be nullified by a court. I think that's a prospect that you as a committee, we as the public, have to be concerned about. And so I had a thought after that meeting of a possible slightly different path that we might go on that could perhaps sort of finesse the situation in a way that would avoid that prospect. If the staff can tell us that there is a charter city that has successfully rejected a state mandate, then we're comfortable doing this. But if they can't, I'm, I'm concerned. So I have this suggestion, which I think you should debate and consider. And it may not be the greatest idea in the world, but it is the idea that I had. And that is this. In the EIR that Mr. Campbell has been talking about, I've never seen an EIR that didn't not only have a proposal, but it had alternatives to the proposal. So I think the staff is going to have to present not only their stable project description that they have, they're also going to have to have some alternative to that. And I am suggesting perhaps the goal, immediate goal of the staff and this committee should be to come up not with one plan, but two different plans that could be presented to the people that would provide the minimum amount of residential density we need to meet the state mandate. We could tell the people of Newport Beach that we have this provision in green light. 
that says the state could override this on us, but at least the state, we, the city of Newport Beach, would like to provide the public with some opportunity to vote on this. So instead of putting one plan on the ballot to be rejected, we could put two plans on the ballot, or perhaps three, and the people would be given yes or no on each of those plans, and we would say in advance that whatever plan got the highest vote would be the plan that we would consider as having been approved by the people of Newport Beach, even if it didn't reach a majority. Uh, is this part of what your email was? Uh, this yes. is a lot to take in. <laughs> I'm sorry. I... All right. That's all right. Um, but I will say that I had a different, I heard things slightly differently than Mr. Mosier. Um, I heard staff politely say <laughs> that uh, they were aware of the issues surrounding green light in the vote, but that the council, at least at this point, had made a determination to go ahead. Now, we are going to have um, at least one new council member um, in the fall. Oh, actually, we'll have at least two, uh, three, whatever. We'll have new council members, hopefully some of the old ones too. And um, that will be a chance to, again, uh, look at the issue and see, because I, I share your concerns, Mr. Mosier, that um, if push comes to shove, we could lose everything. Uh, and that's always been a, a concern. And I, I'm not sure that, uh, I think in, in sometimes in the rush, that, that, that council has also been felt a little rushed and has not necessarily been able to take the step back and, and look at the long term and maybe graver consequences of moving ahead. So, um, I think some good ideas, and I hope you'll we'll get that email and look at be able to look at it more closely. Uh, any other comments? All right. Oh, all right. Uh, thank you, Nancy Scarborough. Again, um, I have a question. I think I understood Mr. Campbell to say that the zoning overlay. Uh, there were promises made to the public that the zoning overlay would be somehow terminated when we reached our arena number. Did I hear that correctly, or am I just being wishful? That's what I heard last time, I thought. I, th I thought I did, but then today I heard it differently, so yeah. I want to be clear, and then I have another question after that. Sure. Um, this is the first time we've talked about that particular kind of provision. We, we've spoke about it at the City Council study sessions, um, at least as a possible Policy. I don't. I don't think the council actually has weighed in specifically on the policy, but the thought would be, um, you know, knowing the community's concerns about housing, is just to open the floodgates and allow as many housing units as possible. Didn't seem like a viable solution. And so the thought is, is that if we actually read our meet our arena needs, you know, can we craft something in these overlays that would in essence turn them off? And so if you meet the arena, then there's no more housing. Um, um, I, I'm not quite so sure we're actually going to meet the arena needs in our eight-year planning cycle. Um, that would be yeah, quite a remarkable feat. Um, but I think that you know, to try and implement that through this policy, um, you know, we'd like to explore that. You know, because I know the community is very concerned about you know overbuilding housing. So, but it's really nothing different than what we've spoken about before. Yeah, you know, I, I may have I, just rephrased it, phrased I, it differently. Yeah. I today. just heard it differently today than I had heard it in yeah. the. Um, previous planning sessions, and it, I heard it a number of times in the previous yeah. planning sessions. So it, it's very important to me personally. I think that was a, a, something that um, gave me a lot of comfort. The second thing is, I, I think Jim's idea has some merit, and I do see how we could end up losing our uh, charter amendment. Um, and given the public, giving the public another alternative, which I've heard isn't possible, but I think there is a degree of possibility, and it's, it's too much to go into here, but uh, that allowed several projects that were somehow funded with um, private money and grants that were a high, very high percentage of affordable, that that would be a more palatable um, solution for the general public, and that you might be able to get people to agree to that more easily than telling them 
that we're going to build all these units and they're only going to be 10% or 15% affordable. So therefore, you're going to end up with 20 to 30,000 units at the end of this process. So I think that there's some merit in exploring that. I don't know how that fits into the um, CEQA study, uh, the CEQA document and the preparation of that and the time frame, but I, I do see value. Well, I think it's always good to have new ideas and think about them. Maybe that particular idea won't work, but it sparks another idea that does, so we'll have to, have to see. Yeah, uh, Nancy, if I might, uh, the housing element does have a policy to encourage those types of projects that she speaks about, the 100% inclusionary. You know, the Bayview Landing Senior Project down at Bayview and, and um, uh, Jamboree is 120 units of affordable senior housing. And that was uh, a quite a financing feat, and it was done back in 2005, I want to remember. Mm -hmm. uh, the city participated in that financing. And so to the extent that we can encourage those projects, it, it then reduces uh, the number of other larger projects that might happen. So there is a policy in the housing element to encourage that. Does it affect how the housing analysis is done? Actually, no. I mean, what, what they're looking at is, okay, there's you know, X thousands of units in the community at these various locations and the affordability level is, it, it, it doesn't really factor significantly into the analysis. So it'll all be included in the analysis. All right. Yes. All right. David Tanner, Newport Beach resident again. Um, I'd like to personally thank staff for their efforts in getting the general plan uh, draft approved uh, by HCD. That's quite an accomplishment. Housing element. Well done. Housing, housing element. element, I'm sorry. Yeah, housing element uh, approved. And I uh, look forward to uh, what I anticipate would be a city council approval on the 15th. And 13th. 13th, I'm sorry. Well, I'll get this here. Um, so it's my understanding uh, that staff uh, provided me the number of 8,174 dwelling units immediately prior to this uh, start of this uh, meeting is the maximum number, I believe the maximum number of housing units allowed by the housing element. And I'm hoping the maximum number allowed by the land use element and the municipal code, the zoning changes, that there will be a cap uh, in the general plan as to a certain number of units. I like the idea of overlay zones. I think they're brilliant. I like them particularly if they can be turned off when we meet the zoning require the the arena requirement of 4,835 units, not 8,174. Arena requirement, what staff is saying is that in order to get ACD approval, we had to show that we could do more than 4,835. They've done that. They've gotten the approval. Congratulations, hats off to you. Uh, but I don't think anybody has been jumping up and down in this city saying we want to have 8,000 units or even 4,000 units. So uh, what my question is, and I'd like, I was trying to get it before the meeting started, but my, my question is to perhaps staff, or you could ask staff or staff could reply, um, now that the uh, HCD has approved the housing element, is their discretionary action over the land use element and all other elements in the municipal code, are they done as long as, for example, if we're committed to doing 8,174 units, that we do that? Or do they come in and do they say, no, you've not, you violated a condition of approval of your housing element by doing this in a different way, we want this differently. Are they out of the picture now as soon as on the 13th our city council approves that? That's a question I would like because it has tremendous impact on how the city moves forward. If HCD is out of the picture, that's terrific. If they're not, we're still going to be bothered by them. So that's one question that I would like to ask, and I've got a couple of others, and I'm All done for right. that. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Okay. Um, now, we have uh, the 8,174 dwelling units. Uh, do these include the maximum? Do these include density bonus units? Do they include other kinds of housing incentives? So we say doesn't look like it. <laughs> That's my understanding, that you don't count the density bonus. Or any it. other incentives for parking or height or any of this stuff. 
Um, you're correct. Okay. You know, when you look at the uh, general plan limits, the density bonuses are on top of that. Um, and, and, you know, when we're dealing with a general plan level analysis, you know, the, the, the concessions that might otherwise be allowed under a density bonus, um, you know, we don't get that granular on a programmatic EIR, but um, um, and it, yes, the density bonus provisions do allow uh, a lot of flexibility for the development community to build additional density. And then what, per, my last question, uh, what protections will you put in place to ensure the total number of housing units, that's 8,174, will not be exceeded? And the reason why this is important is the general plan, the written text, all the conditions, is the project description for the CEQA document. The CEQA document's already being prepared. I don't have a problem with that because there's a lot of background information that they could do. But by not having a precise CEQA document, a project description for the CEQA document, the analysis is way off. And we could very easily, by not including these density bonus units in some form, just pick a number. We've got plenty of assumptions in the housing element. Just do a search for the word assumption. It's all over. So these need to be uh, projected in some form as a worst case analysis or something in the CEQA document. Or we're going to be giving to the public a CEQA document that underestimates the impact. And there's a reason why the public would, the staff would want the public to have a CEQA document that underestimates it because they want to get the public's approval of this plan. Okay. First of all, I do get a sense at times that everybody thinks that staff <laughs> is the only uh, power in the city. And um, it is the council that makes a lot of these decisions. Now, obviously, staff advises them. They have a great deal of confidence in staff. But it is the council that makes these final decisions. Um, we have the 8,000 units. But if we hit 8,000 and hadn't hit, didn't hit our affordable, it wouldn't make any difference. We still have to build more, presumably. Presumably, yes. You know, quite honestly, I don't think we're going to reach 8,000 um, anytime soon, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, you know, we've, 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 we've built basically a little over 44,000 units in the 100 plus years this community's been around. Um, 8,000 units is a significant percentage. I mean, the arena is actually about 11% of our existing housing stock. Um, so we don't anticipate that this will be built within the horizon of this complete general plan, to be perfectly honest with you. So what, what I'm looking at is the actual traffic increases over time are never going to reach the amount that are going to be predicted in this EIR despite what Mr. Tanner is thinking. If, if he thinks we're going to build 10, 20,000 units in the next 20 years, um, I, I, I think that's based on a premise that um, you know, the market doesn't dictate when people build. I mean, developers aren't going to overbuild uh, you know, what can be absorbed into to But I do the think there, there's a point here that uh, perception is often as important as reality, particularly when you have elections. And if there is, I mean, you, we can make the argument that, hey, if we are really going to do it, we will have, if we don't have, uh, in, uh, you know, inclusionary numbers and that sort of things, we will have a lot more than, say, 8,000. And then the EIR will be inadequate. That kind of argument sinks the ship very quickly in, in terms of an election. So I think these are all issues that we really have to address, not just in terms of reality, but in terms of perception as well as we go along. And it will be a challenge. It will be a challenge for the council. It will be a challenge for staff. It will be a challenge for the committee. If, if I could, the, the housing element, I haven't seen it, but it's likely to have a requirement that says you have to do this by this. That's our project description. We don't have, we, I agree with Mr. Campbell, we're not going to meet these numbers, but we have to do an adequate environmental document, and it's based on the project description, which are what the conditions require the city to do. So we have to analyze those conditions in an environmental document, and we have to look at the whole of the action in the environmental document. That's what CEQA requires. So the other thing that we're not going to get now in the housing element, because I would not recommend if staff has HCD approval that they go back and say, hey, we want to do something else. But somewhere in this process, 
we have to look at the cumulative effects of RENA on everybody else around us and what that is going to do to our traffic, and particularly in the well, airport area. These are environmental factors, but they normally would be addressed. These other laws that are in place since our last housing element right. was updated. And, and, and the, don't EIRs have to look at the neighboring cities and the impacts? And they, they would do, be looking at that, the housing element should have done it, but it didn't. So now it's going to go to the environmental impact report, which is under the existing setting. There is the existing physical setting, what you see with your eyes, and the existing regulatory setting. So that existing regulatory setting, and in sequel, you're not supposed to speculate. So staff could say, well, we're not going to do this. It wouldn't be speculation in the housing element itself, the project description, if they would have discussed it there, but they didn't. So now we're going to have to address this cumulative effect in the sequel document, which doesn't like forecasting and speculation and guessing. Uh, they don't like that. So that then leads to a smaller project footprint, individually and cumulatively, which comes out with less impacts, which means there's more of a misperception of what this could do to the city when it goes to the voters. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I should have <laughs> Chuck Vancher, I'm not going to speak to what Nancy and Nancy, Jim, Jim, and Dave spoke about. Uh, I'll be, I'll, I'll disappoint you in that I would just want to comment on Mr. Campbell's slide. Um, I would hope that our city does not get into the ordinance business, the regulation business of prescribing and requiring reuse of buildings and situations, but that the marketplace needs to determine that. So, Jim, I'm hopeful that your discussion wasn't to suggest that our, we would codify the requirement for recycling buildings and not let the marketplace determine that outcome. One comment. And, and, and I would just comment, he did make clear that with these overlays, that doesn't mean that the commercial owner say he, he wants to keep his commercial property, is not forced to convert it into residential. No, he was talking, yes, but he was talking about use, not the physical building. Some of his discussion was, and I read it to be, a, you know, wanting to perhaps have a reuse bill of a building outcome rather than new construction. I'm simply suggesting that should be determined by the marketplace, and our ordinances and code should be indifferent to that factor. Uh, the other thing I want to say is I, 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 am, I, am, I think it is what you were proposing has tremendous value in that it would introduce us the concept of transferable development rights. So that if a parcel has some peak hour trips, commercial trips that they're not going to use and uh, it's just it would, would otherwise be unused, they can sell it to another property that can use it and needs it and we end up with a win-win where properties are fully developed, but we don't, we don't tilt the scale on the traffic impacts. So if you're discussing transferable development rights within the same statistical areas, that's an innovation, and I like it. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? All right. Um, committee announcements. Are there any announcements? Uh, anything that you would like on a future agenda? It's not been listed? All right. Then we are adjourned. Uh, Chair Nancy, real quick yes. before we go, you know, the, the adjournment says September 12th. Um, are we going to meet that night, or are we, or are we going to maybe schedule that and announce that to the community at a later date? Uh, I thought you s s suggested the 19th. What I, I don't, I we don't want to schedule a meeting when you don't have time to, to prepare the necessary things for us to look at. Yeah, I, I think the 12th is not going to work. So right. when, and when we say adjourn, we'll adjourn to the 19th tentatively. Tentatively to the 19th, unless we provide a different schedule. Okay.